everyone, welcome to Tuesday Conversation with Friends. And today I have this amazing and wonderful concert pianist with an international career with me. It's Laurent. Let's make sure I say the last name right. Bukhapsa, right? Yes, thank yes. you. Yes. Well, now, Laurent, would you tell us a little bit about yourself? I would love to hear about your career and uh, what have you done and uh, where you're going. And then we can start from there. Okay, well, um, thank you. First of all, thank you so much, Shirley, for inviting me uh, to your show, to your podcast. I'm very, very happy and excited. We've known each other for some years, and I was yes. when I heard about it, I was like, I, I want to do it, absolutely, because we're friends, and, and I think that's awesome. So, And you do an awesome job, too. So thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this. I am so excited you're here, and I think people are just... They're dying to hear what you have to say because okay. every time when we hear a performance and we see a performer, there's always a curiosity to want to know the person behind the music. So tell us a little bit about your career because you have an international career and it's just fantastic. Yes, um, I, I don't like the word career because I think mm -hmm. many people use it in many ways and I, I don't know how much of this is accurate. Uh, to me, a career should be designed within like 30, 40 years. And then you can say you had a career. Mm -hmm. uh, having a career uh, to, at that point means most likely like having concerts. Mm -hmm. And to be absolutely honest with that COVID situation, mm -hmm. my career has been down the drain like everybody else on this planet. Unfortunately, right. it's very sad. And I'm laughing. I mean, I'm smiling right now, but I'm really not smiling in my heart <laughs> uh, about all of this. But so career, let's just say I, I gave some concerts, I toured, uh, I challenged myself, um, I take di different directions, uh, I learned a lot for myself, about myself, and people were nice enough on stage to enjoy what I was offering. I would phrase it more this way than saying I have a career, mm -hmm. it sounds a little snobbish to me, I have a career, you know. So um, basically, uh, in a nutshell, um, when I was 10 and a half, um, I started piano, mm -hmm. which is pretty late. And then uh, by the age of, uh, and I started in a funny way. Uh, we have to do in France, we'll talk about the how yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, later on, but I started solfege theory uh, for two years because in France you have to do two years of solfege and theory before you can actually touch an instrument. Mm -hmm. And so the director comes at the school and he's like, okay, so who wants to do what? And of course, when he says piano, 90% of the class raise their hand because everybody wants to play piano. And he says, I can't take as many of you. So let me show you some instruments. And he shows some instruments. And then I was kind of a compulsive hand raiser for my whole life. <laughs> and every time somebody says something I don't get, I raise my hand and say, sorry, I didn't understand this. Can you, re can you repeat? Whatever. And he says, anybody has a question about this instrument, which I, I remember very vividly was viola. And so I was about to raise my hand, but I didn't formulate the question yet. And somebody beat me on the pole, believe it or not, and I raised the hand. And he says, blah, 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 question. I don't remember the question, but the answer of the director, I remember very said, oh, that's a great question. I'm going to write you, I'm, you're going to do viola for next year. And I was like, what? Oh you... my God, I'm not asking any questions. <laughs> <laughs> because apparently asking you shall receive, right? As a question exactly. about the instrument, that's what you're going to get. <laughs> <laughs> then a viol after a violist with the oboe, the clarinet. I love all these instruments. They were beautiful, flute and yes. all that stuff. But I wanted to do piano. I was set on piano. Mm -hmm. Why? I don't exactly know. Now I can look for it. But so anyway, comes at the point like who wants to do piano? And then of course half of the class wants to do it. So he says, I can keep only people who have pianos at the house. And then of course lots of people drop their hands and I get my hands up. And he says, Hey, you don't have a piano at your house. And I said, Yes, I do. Well, I didn't. You will. <laughs> so we are in June. I'm not going to say which year because it'll tell me how old I am, but uh, we're in June. So I'm now registered to do piano, except never told my parents. Oh so the classes start in mid-September and we have one class per week. So I'm set up with a teacher in mid-September. And now comes September. Of course, I don't go to piano lessons because my parents have no clue I'm registered for piano. But I go to the conservatory again. And so come October, and then comes the beginning of November. And that, believe it or not, American teacher of all places, that was taught in Oberlin College, which is yes. very, the very yes. first place I was hired in America. 
So oh, kind of a full circle. Full thing. circle. That yes. was crazy. This American teacher calls with a very thick American accent, as I, I might have a very thick French accent. From <laughs> well, I guess it's all relative, depending on where you happen to be at the moment. Somebody they, else has the accent, right? So they call my parents at the house, and they says, "Okay, are you the parents of Laurent Bukabza? Yes. Um, <laughs> you know he's registered for piano. He's never showed up. So there's such a long waiting list. We'll talk about that later on. Le waiting list. If he's not coming, we'll take the next one on the list. But I cannot keep somebody who's not showing up for six lessons." Oh my goodness. But uh, we didn't even know it was registered. I mean, okay. And then they look at me and said, Laurent, what have you done? And I was like, I don't know. And I felt really bad. So I started piano because my mom loved piano and wanted to be a pianist, but that's a long story. And she never became a pianist, but she wanted to. And so, and she studied very, very, very little, but enough to actually draw a keyboard on a piece of paper for the first six weeks of my piano training, when she was drawing black keys and white keys to show me where the C was and where the F was and all these other notes to repair them because I could wow. read notes, but I didn't know what they were on the piano. Right. And for the first six weeks, I actually, I mean, seven weeks, I had piano lessons on a piece of paper. On a piece of paper. And on December 24th night of that year, I received a piano. Yes, finally, <laughs> exactly. finally. My first upright, which I still do have. Oh my goodness. Which is really good, but in France. So that's how it started. I went really fast. Uh, six and a half years later, I entered the Paris Conservatory, which is wow. right, like right. extremely fast. I, I mean, I graduated from the conservatory then, sorry, it took me eight years to enter the Paris Conservatory. And so after that, I graduated from the Paris Conservatory, which once again, we all talk about that, I think. Um, it's not because you enter the Paris Conservatory, which is the highest institution right. in France, you right. actually graduate. But actually, the statistics says that only half who enters do graduate. Yes, yes. So, and let's talk a moment about that, because okay. um, I think I think sometimes we hear people say, oh, this, such and such conservatory is brutal. And uh, they have this debate about whether a person should go through a conservatory style training. Um, the training itself is very different, but there's also the mentality which prepares you to enter into, I know you don't like the word career, but profession, that's to enter into the profession. And because this profession um, as a performing artist is not for the faint of heart. If you think it's hard in school that half the people couldn't make it, yeah, right. think again when you leave school, because Absolutely. you know, you're only competing with people who made it out of a school and then That's some with 20 years of experience on top of that you're competing for the same jobs yes and i think opportunities the, yes the the hardest part probably of this job as opposed to sports for example mm -hmm. is the subjectivity mm -hmm. very very, very so there is some objective stuff, objective statements. But the truth is in swimming, mm -hmm. if I swim the 100 meter in 30 seconds, mm -hmm. I have the world record, period. Nobody's gonna test me. I mean, they can test me if I'm doping and stuff like that. That's a different story. <laughs> but the time in itself will not be challenged. Mm -hmm. Now, it's about speed. Uh, when you talk about music, it's not about speed. It's playing mm -hmm. faster than fast. All the pianists in the world now play faster than fast. So obviously okay. it's not about that. Everybody's developed techniques and everybody's really good. So we have fantastic pianists out there, like amazing, fantastic pianists. Mm -hmm. But it's art. Art is about communicating with an audience mm -hmm. what the composer wanted to say. So the process is as complex and simple as this. A composer has an emotion, a deep emotion. Right. He's a great composer because he knows how to compose. So I'm going to take Beethoven randomly. <laughs> Not at all. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, because uh, I just want to mention in the beginning, we have listened to Chopin's Etude, Opus 10, number four in C sharp minor. And, um, you know, it's technically a study, right? And the Etude is a study, but yes. certainly but it's like it's a study. study. No. Oh no! It's it's a it's a it's a masterwork. Yes. So at that point, composers have a feeling. Mm -hmm. From that feeling, they're going to write a piece of music. Right. But the problem is that, as I say to all of my students, when you play a C or you play a D or you play an E flat or whichever note you pick from the the scale, it doesn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. Which, if I say black or white. Well, when I say black, I mean the color black. When I say white, I mean the color white. And if I go through all the colors, if I say I'm hungry, 
it doesn't mean I'm well fed and so on and so on. So words do have a meaning that everybody can understand. So to that extent, a writer, when they write, it's pretty self-explanatory because we have words. Right, it right. Has, it has feeling related to a musical phrase. Right. And it, it's complicated. So the whole thing is complicated and you have to understand that feeling. And as a performer, Mm -hmm. And you read this, so you have to comprehend that your own way, because everybody's going to comprehend that differently. As I said, right. to all students, bring right. 10 people to a movie theater. They all watch the same movie at the same time. Mm -hmm. Ask them to tell them what is the main element that come out of the movie. And you might come up with five, six, even 10 different answers. That's right. And I and think this is perfect. Yeah, because right now we're going to listen to an excerpt of a very well-known piece by WC. Of course, you know, out of all the examples we're going to hear today from you, he is the only actual French composer. And we're going to listen to this piece that we all know, but Laurent's interpretation is so unique because everybody's different. We're going to listen to an excerpt of Claire de Lune.
so now we just listen to a Claire Deleuze. Talk to us a little bit about your relationship with Debussy and this piece. Okay, so Debussy is a very interesting composer. Mm -hmm. um, first, he is not about the notes, no. but he's about colors. Uh, the, the colors and the ideas. And when we talk about impressionism, I would say when you play Debussy, when you play Ravel, when you play Fauré and so on, think of an impressionistic, the lilies from uh, mm -hmm. Monet. Uh, just think about an impressionistic um, uh, painting. The further you are, the clearer is the image. The closer right. you get, the less, blur, the more blurry is the image. So that means that at that point, what it's reproducing in music is, if you just look at every note as they mean something, mm -hmm. you're wrong. Not every note means something, but together they mean more. I need to have a so understanding of how things work. And that, that section we just heard, there was that big bass, and then these repeated chords. Mm -hmm. Each chord in itself, they don't really matter. Mm -hmm. But what matters is the fact there's a resonance that grows from it that makes you think about something. Mm -hmm. And going back to the discussion before we listen to the recording, mm -hmm. um, that something is the idea that Debussy had. What did he really think about? I really don't know, but I can only imagine. That's so right. But we must way. have an imagination. We yeah. must have an imagination. And I like what you said about the color because... Um, I think depending on the person's development where they are at, sometimes uh, a person as they're making the music fails to listen to what they're doing. Oh, wow, that's another topic. But I wanted to, you're absolutely right, I'll go back to that. Mm -hmm. But what I wanted to say is that as a performer, we perceive that certain way. And then yes. comes the hardest part of all, is to play it. Yes, to go from here to here. We all perceive the way you perceive it, the way, um, yes. WC perceived it. Mm -hmm. So, and the second problem we have is that composers don't have necessarily a super set idea of what they really yeah. want to say. Mm -hmm. It's a mood, of course, like if they want to portray anger, you're not going to think of a wedding scene, obviously. If you don't want to portray a funeral march, they're not going to, and so on. So there are some obvious statements, but sadness, mm -hmm. sadness is a very generic word. Happiness mm -hmm. is a very generic word. It's not... I, are you more happy than me right now? Can you give me five pounds of happiness or five ounces of happiness? So that's very complicated about all of this. Very and, much. And there is one thing that I think that is, we will talk about this, but has been lost a lot. And I've actually wrote papers about this online about the difficulty of international piano competition. Because after I graduated from the Paris Conservatory, I went like all the pianists who want to do a career. Mm -hmm. that this international piano competition to be world renowned like everybody in the world have learned about you and you have that type of a stamp that you're worthy mm -hmm. but the prime of competition is this one and i've run two competitions actually even in orlando right uh, I remember. Very artistic of this um is that you're going to have two type of students i'm going to be very very extreme and very fast it's black and white version i'm giving it it's a lot okay. more subtle than that but it's just for people to get to grasp the concept of it. Mm -hmm. We're going to have the students who gives very little, but it's not controversial. So kind of everyone Safe. Does it. Safe. It's, mm -hmm. uh, both of the, the students play absolutely amazingly well. Okay. Right. Both students are, are very good pianists. Right, right, right. But their version, the one version is good. Mm -hmm. It's safe. Nothing's wrong. Nothing is provocative. Nothing does much than just it's safe. Those are and the people who do well on exams because they check every box off. And so the total number for the score is almost sometimes higher than I think that the other type of student you're just about to talk about. Exactly. It's, well, it's not sometimes risk. higher. It's systematically higher. Yes. Whereas the other ones, mm -hmm. yeah, these ones are very provocative. Yes. They mm -hmm. Proposing something that could be outrageous. Yes. At some point. But even if it's outrageous, at least they come on stage and they propose something. And they propose right. with a lot of strengths that are convinced of what they're doing. And it's somewhat convincing. Now, sometimes it could be wrong, but there is something. Mm -hmm. The problem is this one. As professionals, what is our responsibility to accept or not a provocative statement as opposed to accept or not a non-provocative statement? The problem is for the audience later. The audience wants to receive something that somewhat provokes them. Yes, they want an opinion. Mm -hmm. 
audience is going to be bored very quickly because the audience doesn't have the knowledge. They, yes. They, they can... not listen to the scores of every item. They are listening. They are hoping as they enter into a performance or even listen to something online or streaming the music, they are hoping for emotional experience. Exactly. They want and, to feel something. Exactly. They want to feel something. And when I go to see a movie, I know nothing about movie. I don't know about lighting. I don't know about post synchronization. I don't know about the script. I don't know about scenario. I don't know about putting the camera here or there. I don't know about acting. That's not my business. When I go to a movie, I want to be touched. I want to receive a message. I want to have something. Now, it could be an entertaining movie. It could be a very serious movie. It could be a cartoon. It doesn't matter. I want to receive something. Mm -hmm. And I think the problem we run into with all these competitions is that often the students that, re that receive the highest grade, mm -hmm. often, I'm not saying all the time, but often other people do not provoke anything. I know. It's because interesting. Of the, yes. Because you can make the math. It's out of 25 points usually. Yes. If the one that doesn't provoke has a 22, well, the one that provokes is going to get a 25 from some judges is going to say, yeah, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. They're going to get a 15 from the other one. I know. Well, Yes, because I've had an experience where I remember there was a competition I almost won because I know where my score was so close. But the funny thing is, when it came time for them to offer a performance touring contract, it was offered to me versus the winner. And that's extremely common. And that's, that is extremely common. I have many mm -hmm. cases, unfortunately, I don't want to put names out there. Mm -hmm. But it's extremely common that we have people who win, they don't do much later. And there are people who don't win and they do a lot later. And that's true for every instrument. Very I think true. It's a human mm -hmm. factor. And I think that we are all humans. And I will, I'll, I've done competitions as an organizer, as a right. student, as a, as a jury, and not as organizing it. Yes. And I run into the same problem. We're human and we make mistakes. I know. All, yes. All, nobody can say, oh, because that kid's won that competition, he's definitely the best. No. But you know, it sometimes made me sick as a judge when I judge competitions because I have to give the highest score to the person who met all the requirements. But the person, sometimes there is a, there's a kid who comes in, he's just, he's just special or she's just special. Yeah. But this special person, unfortunately, usually took some risks. So no, they just lost two, three points in one small area, but I couldn't let this person win because that's not how it's set up. But this, now this is interesting because the next excerpt we're gonna listen to as part of, we're gonna listen to a few minutes of the list that plays on La Tour de Dante. And uh, now that piece is challenging and interesting and a very different personality. So let's listen to that. And then we're gonna come back and talk a little bit about uh, a Hungarian who was writing music in France.
Laurent, talk to us about your relationship with this piece because this piece um, obviously requires a very a, a huge baseline of technique and accuracy yeah. because it, without it you cannot be free but obviously you took what we just talked about some risks to, t to have a point of view in the way you played it so let's yeah. talk about that okay so first uh i learned that piece when i was 16 and a half so only oh my God. how do you play it that now versus how you played it then what are the differences something has happened in between it's a joke. I have actually the recording of when I played it because it was at the conservatory where I was. Right. And I listened to it one day and I was like, wow, I can see the talent behind it. I can see there is some stuff, there's spark and all that stuff, but it's so messy. It's so... <laughs> I think when we were young, we just want to get out there, right? Oh, yeah, and yeah. yeah. It's like, it's, there's a little push in the technique, the messiness oh, yeah. in everything, so right? It, it's one of the hardest pieces for piano. I mean, let's, let's, <laughs> yes. let's, it's, it's, and the section that I picked uh, has, a, I don't know, what, about two minutes right before the end, Mm. The, the section of the stump, pum, pum, pee, 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 pum, 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 yeah. that's hours and hours and hours of repetition because it's so difficult. You have to play that piano, which if you play that loud, it would be easier, but he wants that piano. So all the difficulties and um, Lest is known for this. It's like he makes it the hardest at the end of the piece. So when you're the most tired. It's when you're tired, right? <laughs> He's challenging the pianist to its limits. It's just absolutely. I mean, the piece is seventeen some minutes. Exactly. Yeah. So you're, you're you're tired. You can potentially be tired by the time you reach the hardest part of the piece. You know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's well written because there are sections when you can rest also. Yes. But it's extremely challenging. So when you play pieces like this, you always have to remember one thing, and you're gonna love this. The first instrument. I keep saying that for so many years. I've been teaching now. The first instrument of them all remains voice so voice is the rule for everything and any for the simple reason that when humans were a million years old and like a million years ago they didn't have an instrument they definitely not have a piano they didn't even they had a flute maybe that was after because you have to find a tube in which you put hold <laughs> you have... figure out how to make it work right singing is a lot faster and easier that's what we have we sing and we talk so the first relationship we have to have with music is voice. Yes. And every great composer know that. Yeah. And when I do my videos on the 32 Beethoven sonatas, I keep repeating this. Is vocally what you say makes no sense? Don't. Yeah. The composer is going to write concept. against <laughs> the voice. Like, ask any singers to go high on the register and to diminish. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> that is brutal, right? It's, right? it's not natural, human. Right, exactly. It's not natural for every voice. There's some voices that naturally have that tendency and facility, but that's because that's a particular type of instrument, but not all instruments do that naturally. Exactly. And then if you ask a singer to go low and create a crescendo, <laughs> it's very difficult too. So. Yeah. As a pianist, we have other problems that, that the uh, voice don't have, which right. is very difficult for, is that piano, the sound decays. Yes. The singers can increase the sound on a note. Well, we right. can't do that on piano. That's, so that's a huge problem we have. So on that, yes, playing the piano cannot be like the voice. Mm -hmm. But the concept of a phrase, the concept of breathing, the concept of articulation yes. must be respected as if you were a singer. So I say to my students, if you can't sing your line, you won't be able to play them properly. I agree, one hundred percent. It's uh, it's it's so true. And uh, you mentioned in passing about Beethoven, your project. Let's yes. talk about that project and okay. why you chose it. Okay, so I chose it. it took me about ten years so the, before I actually did, finished it one mm -hmm. time, and I started about in. Well, I started when I started the Beethoven Sonata. So I, my first CD had the Wallstein on it and it, I was 20 years old. So that was a long time ago. But um, doing all 32 of them came in about 2010, 2009. Mm -hmm. right. And I said, I want to do a big project. And um, I want a kind of a testament, if you will, of some type of the work I've been accumulating for all these years of, as you said, career concertizing, a master a profession, class. right? <laughs> 
<laughs> being the profession, what can I leave as a message of what I like? And a we legacy. have CDs and recordings. So, mm -hmm. so let's try that. And I said, and the Beethoven sonatas, I found out that I'm a very romantic person. So everything that's Chopin or Liszt, I enjoy it playing even, enormously. Right? <laughs> And I have a good, good response from it. But then there's a personality of me that's very, um, can be very um, mad very quickly, but not for long, you know? And, it's like and a thunderstorm in Florida, right? It comes yeah. and it's like big and it just pours on you, but then it's over. It's over after an hour, except for me, it's more like seconds than hours. But <laughs> right. <laughs> so exactly. And so I thought, okay, and then, of course, I've played Beethoven. And I was like, I think the 32 Beethoven sonatas are a big part of what I think. And then there's another aspect that interested me a lot. I found out that we have two testaments in the world of music. The first testament is the 48 President Fugue from Bach from the World Empire. Yes. Right. Because that's when Bach set the rules, or the rules were set by Bach. I don't exactly know how to say it because it's. Right. It's um, Bach and the rules, however yeah. they come, right? It's how to compose music, mm. basically. In the world of harmony, in the world of counterpoints, is how to compose music. And then he wrote 48 President Fugue on the well-tempered clavier, because at that time, it was the first time that the whole keyboard was tempered, so everybody mm -hmm. could play the same music all over the Europe, because the world was not yet. So all over Europe, and everybody would sound the same. Because before that, people would sound completely different between Germany, Italy, England, and France. Mm -hmm. So whatever you compose would sound very different because if there's three shops or four shops, they use a different system. So this piece sounds weird. Well, yeah. it's not it's anymore. And Bach writes about this on the World Tempered Clavier. But then there's another composer pretty famous uh, that wrote 32 sonatas and hits the second pillar of all the foundation of classical music. And I was like, 48 President Fugue from Bach or 32 Beethoven Sonatas. Which pillar do I want to, to talk about? And I felt a lot closer to the 32 Beethoven Sonatas because I wanted to explain to everyone that all these 32 Beethoven, there is no piece written after Beethoven that doesn't take from Beethoven or from Bach or from both as of today. Everything written has a structure that somewhat resembles what Beethoven brought or what Bach brought. So basically, I'm not saying that they're copying Bach or Beethoven. Don't misunderstand. No, no, no. But there's a natural development that's been so profoundly, exactly. so and organically they, influenced. And they set the foundation. So they are the foundation. It's kind of saying the reason why we have electric cars is because we had cars to start with. Right. That's my point. Electric cars have nothing to do with the first engine we had, except there are four wheels, there's a, and so on and so on. Now the Flintstones. <laughs> no. You can drive by themselves, maybe they're computerized, blah, blah, blah. Okay, fine. But it still remains a car, which has a body, transport four people or six people at, or eight people whatever, at once with four wheels. So the, the bottom line, the concept of it remains the same. It has an engine that runs electrical or gas matter. That's, the, that's my point. That's my analogy. If you take cars and Beethoven, it's the same story. It means that the cars have evolved, but they come from a, a, a fundamental point. That's the same. That's what Beethoven did with his sonatas. He set all the foundation of how to write music and how to get away from it also. Right. So right. I choose. So here it is. I'm in March 2000. The backtrack a little bit. March 2020. <laughs> I'm supposed to go by the end of March to France to record because of a great recording studio. I'm very happy. I'm excited. Mm -hmm. And then COVID hit. And now right. the borders are closed. Nobody can travel. So I said, OK, it's going to last some weeks, as we all thought, uh, maybe some months at the most. So I start doing videos on my YouTube channel mm -hmm. um, because at that by time. By the way, people, you're going to find a link in the district description. Go okay. Go visit it and subscribe so you can see all the newer videos that's coming up by Laurent as well as visit the old ones. I just want to put that in there so people remember to check it out. So now continue. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. Thank you very much for subscribing <laughs> to my channel. It's a lot of work. It's an enormous amount of work. Oh my gosh. And I do that, and I do that for the people to watch. I'm trying to, in this video, to help them Mm -hmm. to perceive and understand Beethoven Sonata in a different way. So there's always an explanation that lasts between three to 10 minutes when it's long. And then I play the piece uninterrupted and then there's a little outro. 
And the reason why I did this is because at that point, my daughter comes visit for spring break mm -hmm. and they get locked because you cannot go back to Ohio yeah. either. So now they stay for two and a half months, which was the most amazing time of my life because they live in Ohio with their, uh, their mother. And so I had them finally with me for two and a half months nonstop. And Wonderful. we were together, we couldn't go out. So we, we developed a bond that was that's even stronger now than it's ever been. So that was, I'm sorry to say this, and I'm, I'm going to be apologetic for what I'm saying, but not for what happened to me. COVID was the best time of my life. You know what? Because I, of that think, I think a lot of us, um, I kind of feel the same way because I think that time to be in, and for musicians, yes. because we're accustomed to hours of solitude in our development and continuing that as we continue to uphold the standards for our profession, which requires us to do that. I think COVID is almost like a perfect um, excuse for us to turn down social engagements, That, but now we don't have to do that. It just happens, right? That, that, that's very good. Cool yeah. So so I'm back and I said to my daughter, what can I do? And they were like, well, dad, why don't you just do a video on how to teach online? Because then I started teaching online mm -hmm. and I re I'd recognize that there was a lot of challenges with it, about yes. the sound, about mm -hmm. how to talk to the students and for them to, because it's so much easier when you're next to them. No, do this, do that. Let me show you on the piano and so on. You can't do any of this online. So I started do four, five, six, once per week cl uh, classes that you can find on my, so subscribe to my yes, channel. that's right. Uh, Exactly. And so you find that uh, online. These are the first videos. And then after a while, I was like, okay, I'm not going to keep doing these videos, not because I don't like them, but I want to try to start a Beethoven. So let's use these videos as a uh, dress rehearsal for when the COVID will end and I can go on a studio recording. And I was like, instead of just playing them for playing them, right. why don't I express to people what I like about the sonatas, what, why they are different, what they can look for in it how the structure is set and how the structure will disappear. Basically, the first sonata is a pretty standard sonata. So it's the first three. They are pretty right. standard. They're already... They're the different. first ones that a lot of times students start with too because they are very straightforward. Exactly. They're pretty simple. First one and fifth one. Although I found out that second, second and third are extremely difficult for pianists, but that's besides the point. So the structure and the way it's written is pretty standard. Mm -hmm. There are, there are twists, but it's pretty standard. But then you go to the last three, and now there's nothing standard about these sonatas at all. So how do you go from super standard to no standards at all? The last, the last, the famous Opus 111 has actually two movements. And the first movement is somewhat of a sonata form, but it, I'll explain that when it comes. And the last movement is a variation. And that's it, it ends this way. And Beethoven and so said, unusual. oh, it's really, it's really odd. Form-wise, it's completely odd. Right. It it's not a sonata form that we think of. And it's well, not a structure of the multi-movements in the relationships to each other, as we're accustomed to as far as, I mean, later sonatas from other composers in the Romantic and the more modern era, sometimes they don't always follow the format. But when you think of a composer that straddles between the classical and the Romantic period like Beethoven, you expect that formality and then yes. he travels from the very beginning of the 32 to the end. Yes. It really changes. Now, Laurent, it's taken you about 10 years to develop this project. Yes. Yeah. And I think it's important for people to hear that because yes. so often people take it for granted to say, wow, look at him. He did all the sonatas and they think you did this in six months. Yeah, exactly. I read the books and then I just learned the music, memorize and I play. No, it's years. And I want to say about this, it's something very controversial I have done and I'm very happy with it because I study also the music, musicology behind it and I'm trying to bring yes. more than just my personal perception mm -hmm. it is uh, if people want to watch this, it's very important. I'm renaming officially the Moonlight Sonata because the I saw the that. <laughs> The first movement, I think the, the, the first movement shows, demonstrates very clearly that this sonata should never been, first of all, has been named Moonlight in 1852. The sonata was written in 1801. Beethoven never wanted any title on his pieces. So that's the beginning. I'll let you listen to the rest of it, of the whole demonstration of why it should be called a funeral sonata fantasy. Because it's a funeral piece. It is not a moonlighty, happy, dreamy type because moonlight if you think anybody what's the moonlight it's dreamy it's lovers walking hands on hands next to each that's other not Beethoven. 
Well, that's not that sonata for sure. Right. Mm-hmm. It's not the sonata for sure. It's definitely not the 14th sonata that everybody knows. It's actually funeral. It's 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 melancholy. Yes, it's very much so. And there's yeah, even it's not- anger in some of the movements. The passion was not a romantic passion that you imagine what the passion between romantic lovers would be. It, exactly. it, it is not that kind of passion. And so I think I think a lot of times young students, they get drawn to the idea of playing the sonata. But as we mature, we begin to hear a much more complex humanity in this music. Absolutely, yes. Mm-hmm. And, and, uh, and we will get to hear that we'll get, get, you know, at the end of the, uh, the video, you get to you get to watch the um, we get to hear the, the uh, that particular sonata play by Laurent. And uh, so, Laurent, now in closing, I'd yes, love yes. to get an idea from you that you think would truly help people. Um, we can go with two directions, either a closing as a message for the people who may be students, or we can have a closing with an idea, maybe both, to the audience members who who walk into a concert hall or who turn on the YouTube or who start streaming. Um, as a pianist, as a as a person who makes the music happen, to go f- to to make the leap from what's on the page to what's being heard. I'm going to say I'm going to say mm-hmm. uh, the message I would say is this one. Concerts are extremely important, but to me, they are more important for the audience than they are for the artists. Mm, yes. you're, an artist, you're an artist at heart. That means that you live the heart, the, the art, mm-hmm. and your heart, that's why I was confused with these words, your heart is filled with music and art the entire time. So as much as people might think, artists enjoy going on stage and share it with the mm-hmm. audience. But I think... The audience needs it a lot. And what they need is this. I'm going to show you this. When an artist play on stage, there is a glass. There's a wall. There's right, some the fourth thing. wall. Mm-hmm. There's a glass. It's transparent. Nobody can see that. Mm-hmm. But there's a wall between them and the audience because the communication has not been made yet. And right. they're going to have to have this communication. If the artist is too strong, too forceful, yes. too direct, the wall's going to fall on the audience and the audience is going to start protecting themselves. That's right, so that's right. Mm-hmm. And they feel like, oh my gosh. If the artist is too shy or quiet or whatever we want to... Withhold, it, withheld, right? Exactly. Mm-hmm. Then that goes the other way because the other is going to say, give us, give us, we need more. Mm-hmm. And the guy is going to, you know, the person is trying to retract more. Mm-hmm. But in fact, the ideal is to find that perfect balance between that moment when you, let's say, dominate, and then they dominate. And if you have that perfect balance, that glass will stop in the middle and will disappear. And at that point, you have real communication between an audience and an artist. Mm. And I think that's what audience should expect from a concert. And that's what us as artists, we should provide. That is beautiful. And that's so, that's so clever because you just address both the audience and the people who are maybe in the process of developing. And uh, Laurent, thank you for being so generous with your time with us today. And uh, I just, I think this was a wonderful conversation and I, I, ha- I, I know other people will feel the same way as they watch and listen. And we also got to see you perform. Now we're going to conclude the program with the Moonlight Sonata. So feel free to stay through the entire thing because it's okay. a treat. So, okay. yes, uh, until next time. Absolutely. Thank you so much for inviting me again, Shirley. Can't wait to do another one if it's possible. Yes, yeah. I will love that. I will love that. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you so, so much for inviting me again. I'm very, very happy. Thank you for being here. You're welcome. Now let's listen to this. Okay.